By the end of 1942, the Second World War has grown more and more asymmetrical. The Axis hoped to nullify their enemy's economic advantage through rapid conquest and by crippling their supply lines, yet they have ultimately failed to bring the war to a quick conclusion using military means alone. Now the Allies are recovering and kicking their war economies into high gear, and in an undecided war, the numbers begin to turn dramatically against the Axis powers. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II special episode looking at some of the war in numbers at the end of 1942. When they declared war on the United States in December 1941, the Axis powers did not just bring another belligerent onto the Allies' side. They declared war on the largest economy in the world. Still largely unaffected by the fighting so far, U.S. industries can rely on an abundance of fuels and metals, a huge pool of skilled labor, and a highly competitive entrepreneurial class who have access to the world's largest capital reserves. Seven million unemployed Americans were called into the workforce, which itself will expand by more than 50% over the coming years. The U.S. economy overall experiences unprecedented expansion. From 1941 onwards, it increases up to 55% in size, with military expenditures steadily rising from 1.4% of GDP to more than 45%. The reach of this expansion is already felt in 1942. Now involved in a two-ocean war, the immediate concern is to boost U.S. maritime power. Constant improvements in assembly line efficiency and new methods of prefabrication make production numbers skyrocket. For example, in the shipyards of Henry Kaiser, here the time it takes to construct the 10,000-ton Liberty Merchant ships shrinks from 230 days to just 41 days by the end of 1942. In fact, the record is set in late November by the construction of the Robert E. Perry, built in just four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes. Although largely a propaganda stunt, it is done to demonstrate how much more quickly the U.S. can produce replacements than the Axis submarines can sink them. The next important thing is air power. Not that many B-17 flying fortresses existed in the U.S.'s pre-war arsenal, but now the air forces want to have hundreds if not thousands of these mighty bombers as quickly as possible. But Boeing alone can simply not produce the desired numbers that quickly. So the U.S. federal agencies step in and force Boeing to share the B-17's design with its main competitor, the Douglas Aircraft Company. And when Douglas needs a new factory to concentrate on producing the B-17, the government offers to purchase the land, pay for the construction costs of the factory, and even help to circumvent unfavorable tax laws. This means that the government owns the factory and every single tool inside, and Douglas just needs to operate it. And because the B-17 isn't cheap, this leads to an enormous profit margin. Initially, cost estimates were between 56 and 88,000 US dollars for each plane, but this soon rises to about 250,000 in 1942 dollars. In 2021 money, that's $4,200,000 for a B-17. Such a strategy allows for massive expansion. In 1939, the U.S. had only about 9.5 million square feet of industrial plant space devoted to aircraft production. Over the next five years, this increases 18-fold, reaching 165 million square feet by the end of 1944. The giant Willow Run B-24 plant in Michigan alone reaches a size of 3.5 million square feet. It is this mix of free enterprise laissez-faire economics and a sprinkle of good old government intervention, which means that the U.S. industry can reach production rates the world has never before seen. While it still takes around 54,800 man-hours to build a single B-17 bomber in early 1942, this drops to under 18,600 hours over the next two years. Same goes for more complex and expensive projects like the B-24 and B-29, whose production times will be cut by more than 40% throughout the war. In the year 1942, the U.S. produces more than 47,800 military aircraft. This is three times as many as Germany can produce, and almost double what Germany and Japan can produce combined. 
1943, American output increases to 85,000. By comparison, the Soviet Union will produce 35,000 aircraft that year, and Germany just 24,800. In the meat grinder of the Eastern Front, the consequences of this growing disadvantage are not immediately felt. Instead, the German soldiers feel increasingly swallowed up by the sheer vastness of Soviet territory they occupy. To give you an idea of the everyday dimensions of the Eastern Front, I will take you on a little journey. Imagine an officer of the Austrian 45th Infantry Division leaving Hitler's Wolfschanze headquarters in mid-July 1942. To rejoin his unit and his Army Group B, he takes a plane from the airfield near Angerberg in eastern Prussia to the closest Luftwaffe airstrip at Oro. The linear distance is about 940 kilometers. With an average speed of 250 kilometers an hour, the flight takes maybe four hours. During this time, he flies over the new Reichskommissariat Ostland, the administrative name the Nazis have given to the territory of the Baltics and Belarus. Ravaged by war, its southern part, White Ruthenia, seems especially empty. It's a huge area, 210,500 square kilometers in total, but fewer than 7 million people are still living here. The only thing visibly bustling with activity is the German railway. The railway network for the army group spans 8,000 kilometers. It sticks out from the air as 300 meters on each side of the tracks has been cleared of bush and scrub. It is intersected by supply depots, which have warped into little fortresses from where the thinly stretched German security forces set out on anti-partisan patrols. This railway is the lifeline of the Wehrmacht in the east. Reinforcements, material, animals go one way, soldiers on leave, the wounded, and captured equipment goes the other. The demands of a regular infantry division like the 45th are enormous. Its roughly 17,000 men need a total of 170 tons of food, fuel, and ammunition a day to remain operational. To supply each soldier with 4,000 kilocalories, the field bakeries need to bake at least 12,000 loads of bread a day. And butchers must butcher either 15 cows, 120 pigs, or 240 sheep each and every day. You do the math for the 2.7 million German men in the field in 1942, and that's one nation of many fighting. But while the German logistical system was adequate for the Western campaigns, it was never intended to handle these dimensions for very long. The second German army is responsible for a front line of 320 kilometers. When our Austrian officer finally arrives at its sector, he'll find the 45th Infantry on the far left flank, taking up new positions at Trudki. While the rest of the army group pushes towards the Don, it is their job to hold their part of the line, but this is easier said than done. Just to make the area at Trudki defensible, they calculate the need to put in at least 40,000 hours of work. They needed to move a minimum of 3,000 cubic meters of earth, 1,000 cubic meters of stone, clay, and wood, and lay 10,000 mines in just their section of the line. German doctrine plans for a 17,000 strong infantry division to defend a front line of around 10 kilometers in length. In reality, this can easily extend to three times that size. 30 kilometers means that 100 meters of trench line are defended by just 4.3 German soldiers. A typical frontline sector on the Eastern Front is also usually between 15 and 20 kilometers deep, from the most forward fighting lines to the commander's headquarters in the rear. Although it is not a network of trench after trench like, like in the Great War, it is still fairly complex. For example, all 18 villages in the sector of the 45th Infantry have been fortified and incorporated into a hedgehog-like defense in depth system. Should the forward trenches be overrun, these are the places to stop Soviet tanks. And the danger of Soviet tank breakthroughs on the Eastern Front is steadily growing. The Red Army lost the staggering amount of 10,000 tanks in the first two months of the war alone against Germany, and was reduced to just 1,500 tanks by the fall of 1941. Yet Soviet industry has recovered, and over 1942, they're able to pump out 28,000 new tanks. 
losses this year are still tremendous, exceeding 15,000 tanks destroyed. Nonetheless, the margin is still favorable, leaving the Red Army with a surplus force of at least 7,000 active tanks in the field at all times. By comparison, the Germans begin 1942 with a force of 4,362 panzers and are able to produce 6,189 more. However, they lose nearly 7,500 of them over the year and by December are left with not even 3,400 panzers. A tank, by the way, is counted as a loss not necessarily when the machine is shot to pieces, not only that. A total loss is also counted when 75% of its crew is either dead or incapacitated. And losing an experienced tank crew hurts, since training takes way more time than manufacturing. For the Soviet tank force, drivers and mechanics are trained for nine months, the gunner for four, and a loader needs two months of training. This training time is an important factor in calculations, as the average life expectancy of a tank and its crew in active use on the Eastern Front is only a couple of months. On average, the lifetime of a Soviet tank, from leaving the factory to being destroyed in the field, is less than six months. Interestingly, the Germans study the serial numbers of destroyed Soviet tanks to learn the date and place of manufacture. The road life of Soviet tanks varies from 1,000 to 1,500 kilometers and easily reaches 200 hours of running time. If a T-34 can run for 400 or 500 hours and survive, it is due for a complete overhaul. Its German counterpart, the Mark IV, needs three to four weeks to be overhauled. Tigers and Panthers can take five to six weeks, but that is if spare parts are available. If not, that is easily another month before they are back at the front, since it takes on average four to six weeks to bring in spare parts from Germany. By comparison, the simplicity of the T-34 gives the Soviet tank force much more flexibility. As long as the turret ring of the T-34 is not badly damaged, you can simply switch a turret to another chassis and vice versa. With production increasing, and the help of Lend-Lease, Soviet factories also bulk up on spare parts. That leads to tank engines and transmissions being replaced rather than repaired, making Soviet tanks much quicker to get back to the front lines. The Eastern Front and the Second World War overall have undoubtedly turned into a war of numbers. In this battle, the qualities of the individual soldier and the advantages of superior tactics and leadership are slowly but surely becoming less relevant. After all, quantity has a quality of its own, outproducing the enemy by turning money and resources into tanks, ships, and planes might end up being the war-winning strategy. The numbers don't lie. Of course, these are only a tiny fraction of all the production and logistic numbers of the war, but we thought you'd find them interesting. Spartacus is doing a War in Numbers episode on the War Against Humanity series, which has either just come out or will come out fairly soon, so keep an eye out for that. If you want to see another good logistics episode, this one about the Luftwaffe and the Soviet Union, you can click right here for that. And to get more of these specials and more of series like War Against Humanity from us, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.